placing characters on the scene. Everyone should have, I know we have a couple people just hopping in with us, but we're assuming you have a scene made <clears throat> point in time. Um, and now we're gonna add interaction to our scene a little bit. Um, so the lesson tells you about both 2D and 3D again. Um, we're gonna look at our 3D uh, people and you wanna pick two characters that you might want if you're going to be doing this quest kind of idea. Um, so the character, your player, and then also a, a non-player character or the quest giver. So two kind of two entities. Um, and to do that, you want to think about the quest for your game. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch over to looking at my beautiful game. Go to the right <clears throat> and not cheat anymore. There we go. So I have my island, I have a little trail, a little brick path, campsite, campfire, plateau that I think I might make taller later, I haven't decided. Um, so I'm gonna go on over to, get it to focus on the palette, thank you. Um, I think for mine, I'm going to use the humanoids out of space 3D for my characters, just because I would like to have human, not hips. Um, but again, that's going to be up to you. And you add them exactly the way you've added your terrain. Pick the character out of the uh, palette, hit enter. They're going to show up on your screen somewhere, and you can place them. Over, let's pick the alien looking guy as my other one. And I'm going to put him over here by the water for right now. So I have alien one, and I have, I don't remember what my guy's name is, so let's just find him. Um, I have a lot of people. Oops, missed it. Black Astronaut and Alien One are my two characters. So, everybody got ideas for the people or places they are uh, characters they want to sit down. with that part. <clears throat> Hearing no screaming of dissent. I hope while you were planning out your map, you're kind of thinking about what the rest of the game is going to look like, but that's silly me making assumptions, you know. So we're actually going to next kind of leave our scene and we're going to leave our code for a minute. We're actually going to hop over to a, sorry, I've done weird things with my screen, um, tutorial uh, in Quorum about basic types and outputs. So that link go into the chat or into Slack for everybody. And this activity is going to let everybody see, after I swap screen shares here, um, some of the online features that we have for Quorum. 
So this lesson is actually able to be run completely online. Uh, you can run it off your phone, your tablet, your laptop, your desktop, anything for this one. Um, it has the, the ID is right there online for us. So I know we've talked a little bit about who's done quorum before, but how many people have done like zero programming at all before? Anybody just complete starter for programming in general? Great. I heard nobody scream and cry, so I'm going to assume we've all got some sort of knowledge. Um, so there are primitive types for variables. Uh, we have four in Quorum. The standard, anybody want to make some guesses so that I'm not the only person talking today? And if you've done this before, you can cheat and go ahead and answer. Good. And if I work with you, I might call on you. I mean, I have to work with Gina now too. So she's equally able to be thrown under the bus, Mike. I would be happy to answer, but I don't understand. Uh, did you ask a I question? I asked, what are our primitive types for variables? Integer, numbers, Boolean. One more. Text. Text. Good job. Integer, number, Boolean, and text. Uh, those words are pretty uh, self-explanatory. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just like play through the lesson here. So I'm looking at the lesson that is the tutorial types and variables. So an integer, um, the difference between integer and number is the key thing to kind of nail for students. Um, a lot, mix them up, flip them back and forth, don't really understand the difference. Uh, integer, positive and negative, but no, um, no decimal points. And that can make a very real difference depending on what you're doing with that variable. Um, so, oh, we actually, need to update this tutorial. It still says you don't have to declare in front of a new variable. So I'm going to ignore that second one. Uh, oops, somebody write that down. Oh, Amanda? Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think what it is is it's, the, it's a carryover from the block above it. There's the declaration is the integer a above it, maybe? But which thing? That you, that you can say A equals two. No, it actually says you can optionally leave it off, but I thought we changed it back, Andy. No, no, you can leave it off. Oh, I thought it got changed back. Okay, my bad. Yeah, there's a, that's, a, that's allowed. Okay. It's because there's, uh, there's, there's evidence on this. I could go into the details on it, but... The, I, and I remember that discussion, but I also... Yeah. It had been like new evidence and changed back, so I was wrong. No big deal. Yeah, the, the, the evidence basically shows that <clears throat> uh, novices get that first word integer wrong quite a bit, but if it's on the inside of a function, <clears throat> that it doesn't cause any harm for people that are experienced. Whereas if you leave that off on the declaration of a function, that, that actually does cause harm for those that are professionals, oddly enough. So it, uh, this particular, on the inside of a function like this is actually okay, so. So with an integer, we can just, you can declare it either way. That's what we're saying here. So you can either type the word integer, integer space, lowercase i, integer, a space, and then whatever you're going to name your variable. In this case, we've named it a. Um, you could give it a more descriptive name of int a or whatever it's going to be used for, an age or whatever. Um, I'll just follow the lesson here and say A, and then I put a space around the equal sign. It doesn't actually need it. And then the value of 10. 
So I've now assigned the value of 10 to the variable A. On the next line, we're going to do an output, which is just a print statement. So it's going to print to the screen the variable A. So I typed output with lowercase o, a space, and then the letter A. And build, or we can just go ahead and run. I'm going to go ahead and run because I'm fairly certain my game will not, my um, code will run. And what it does when you're online, um, after you run your code, it opens a new tab. And you have two main portions to this environment. You have a console output and a visual output. Uh, all output statements will show up in the console output when you're using the online uh, editor, okay? And you can navigate there via headings if you want or visually. And there I have the number 10 printed on my screen. Yay, basic output. Does that make sense to everybody so far? Nobody's crying. Everybody spelled integer correctly. I'm crying on the inside, just so you know. Okay. Well, I don't, you know, Andy, you don't you don't matter. That's fair. It's fair. Likewise, they're gonna have us try a number. And we said it, but what's the difference between a number and an integer, somebody? Decimal points are allowed. Decimal points are allowed. Very good. So I have typed in, make it match, sorry. I have typed in number space a space equals space 10.4. And then the word output, new line, the word output. And I'm going to type in the letter A. When I run this bad boy, in theory, I get console output, output of 10.4. Um, and another oh, my neighbors decided it's time to mow the lawn. Another uh, form of output you can do is a say statement. And then when you run, it will speak the, um, the value for you. If you're tired of reading the screen and you want it to talk to you, you can do that. Can I add a tip at this point before you go on? Please. I find that if you omit the leading zero, on, on actual numbers that are less than one, it doesn't function always the way you expect it to. Just a hint. So if we were to say just point 0.4 with no zero is what Tim is saying, and I run it, I get an error message. I did not understand. Line one, column 11. No viable alternate at input decimal point. So that's telling me I have something wrong at that point. Yep. Back over my code. Yep. Look at that. It does want you to say 0 0.4. Try again. 0 0.4 printed to my screen. And just for the record, the online, if you're using this online instead of in Quorum Studio, you do get the old error messages in yeah. the Quorum online. And that's because the new version of Quorum 9 won't go out till probably December or so for, uh, for that. There's a, in order to make all that stuff work, we have to make things accessible too. And so the, we're still kind of inventing that piece. So. so the old messages for now, a lot of other stuff is being changed online at the same time. So that's, that's why. I heard breathing. Was there a question? <laughs> no? Okay, great. Our next type is a Boolean, which is spelled B O O L E A N. It's 
Amanda. Yes. This is Danny here. Sorry, I. Um, but um, I was able to get on my laptop, and I'm I'm running uh, 2.3. I had a computer issue. <laughs> um, I, I'm sorry. I'm kind of confused. I know yeah. online. I've I've done a little bit of this online. How am I doing this in 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 the code uh, Quorum Studio? Like, where am I going to type this in? Am I going to Control One or ah. Control Two? I'm a little if, confused. Where? If you were going to do this in Quorum Studio, it would be in source code main.quorum. We are doing it there because right now the file you have open has all of the templates and stuff that you need for your game. And okay. our current activity has nothing to do with the game, so you would end up with lots of random things. Okay, that's what was getting me kind of confused. So we're, we need to be yep. online? Yes, to the website. This is the okay. online. This okay. Many okay. I'm, I'm just having problems getting signed in. Okay, thank you. Sure. Sorry about that. And you don't okay. have to be signed into Quorum to use this lesson. The only time you really need to be signed in to Quorum is if you want to save your files. Save your okay. Files. I'm okay, teacher. thank you. <laughs> Not a problem. So, Booleans. Who knows what a Boolean is? Why does my computer want me to play music? Stop. Okay, sorry. I'm not going to answer every question today. Come on, somebody else must be out there. True, false statement. True, false statement. Yay! Good job. Um, also, someone who's already been to Epic. Good job, Adam. You remembered a whole year. I'm so proud of <laughs> Two whole years. <laughs> Okay, then you really should remember by that. Um, so yeah, Booleans can only accept true or false. Um, so I don't love the uh, I don't love the example here for our healthy Boolean, but that's okay. Um, we'll start by, um, they start by showing you that you can do the exact same thing. We can write Boolean A equals true, and that is lowercase p to the Boolean, space, A, space, equals space, and then the word true, and you do have to spell out true, not just write T. Then I can output it. The same way. No quotes are needed, just the true. Oh. Yes, just the true. Um, good question. The quotes will be needed when we get to text. Text variables. Scroll. Thank you. Run. I have a true. I hope I'm not going through these steps too fast for anyone. If I am, please, honestly, yell at me. Now they give us a little bit of sample code that lets us uh, see how a Boolean would work. Um, and I want to change it up. So let's pick some different things here. Let's use two integers and compare them. Um, integer A, somebody give me an integer. Five and six are lame. Let's use something different. How about 15? 15, integer A, space equals space 15. My integer B. Seven. Seven, great. Whoops, I forgot an equal sign. What he yelled at me, that's cool. Now we're gonna have a Boolean and we're gonna call it answer and an equal. And this is going to be if A is greater than B, okay? Now, we're going to assign answer to a new variable of C. We don't have to do this step. But they have C equals answer. 
and then our new line output C. Now, when I output C, what should I get? Boolean is answer, A is greater than B, and Boolean is only gonna be true or false, right? So if A is 15 and B is seven, what output should I get? Hopefully true. Hopefully I get the word true. I got the word true. Very good. Now, walking through this right here and thinking about the output before hitting run um, is uh, just a great exercise for everyone for reading, you know, for students for reading their code and thinking through it. Um, especially if you are a teacher who's going to be teaching like the CSP class, there are many, many, many questions on the multiple choice test that are read this code and decide what it outputs. So um, it's, it's, you know, good logic. What should your code do and then match it, right? Um, I just wanna show that if we didn't make it this C here, we just said output answer. It will also just output the true. You did not have to assign an answer to another variable. Because it's already a variable, right? Because it's already a variable, yep. And as soon as it runs through and decides A greater than B, it has saved that variable as, you know, it has saved that information as answer. So when the answer is already called a Boolean, um, so the C doesn't need to have a Boolean in front of it. Um, is that right? So that's the kind of implicit way of quorum understanding what's the type of variable is. Yes. So yeah, exactly. So C equals answer. Uh-huh. Understood. What I got you. C okay. Yep. 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 Perfect. And then just so we know it's not, you know, always showing us true, I'm going to flip flop so that I have A less than B. So I just changed my line of code that said Boolean answer A greater than B. I made a Boolean answer equals, sorry, I forgot my equal sign, A less than B. Mm -hmm. Oh, in theory, I should get the word false, right? And we did. If you always use examples that show true, sometimes students don't learn the fact that Boolean will actually spit out the word false, right? So make sure they get to see it go both, both answers. Um, those are just things I've learned over the years of teaching forum. So let me kind of get close, you know, this is kind of new to me and not the Boolean stuff, but so like a, uh, like a Python, uh, language Python that's, you know, do, does those kind of stuff. Like you can do, you know, C and then quotation and then, you know, string in it. And then it just uh, automatically declares that C as a text variable and stuff like that. So, we can do the same kind of things in the quorum. That's what it is. Yes. Uh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. And you can do it on the, you can do it for any variables that are um, <clears throat> on the inside of functions. And then, but the one place that it's forbidden is on the declaration of actions. I know that we haven't gotten to that for everybody, but I know Ko knows that stuff. And the reason for that is because there's some evidence that if you are um, a programmer past like three years of experience, there's some evidence that it actually lowers your productivity quite a bit if you don't have those on action points. And the reason is because you don't know what to pass a function. And so you have to go look that up and that time difference is the, is the difference in time or productivity that it, that it takes away. So and I recall that if, when you look at the wobble in between individual programmers, it accounts for about 
14 percent of the variance between people so I, I know that statistic off the top of my head so in other words we allow it in certain places and we explicitly don't allow it in a couple others because of the, what the data shows so i see yeah anyway there okay. I've, I've bored you i've done it that's my goal so. good job Stephanie. good job you're welcome i know when i'm teaching it i do make sure students explicitly just declare it so that they know what they're making it between with integer and number um especially because they'll get a surprise that wait my i did division and i didn't end up with a decimal point or or whatever else they might be trying to do um and that also helps them when they go take that AP exam. so my frame of reference most of my students if they're actually they're building up to take that AP exam. So, um, I muted myself. Reinforcing that helps them um, understand it on the exam a little better. Okay. And then our final type is text. And text has the, um, the need for everything to be in quotation marks when you uh, assign the value. So if we have text A equals, it has to be an open quotes, and we'll use our lovely phrase of hello world. And then we can output it. And it will give me hello world on my screen. There you go. And text is a string for anyone who's used to other languages. Okay. Moving down on our ideas. Type conversions. So, um, this is most useful if you've gotten input from a user, um, especially in forum. Input is saved as text, and maybe you want to then do a mathematical operation on it, so you need it to convert to a number or an integer. Um, they show us here that text can be digits. Um, so if I type in text, and then the variable name they've given here is some text. And they've said 4.2, but they've put it in quotation marks. Okay. That changes those digits from being able to have computational values into text. They're just the shapes of letters now that are 4.2. Does that make sense? The difference there from being able to do math on them versus just look at them? Nobody's crying, nobody's screaming. So let's say I've done this and I have some text and I want to <clears throat> change that to a number value. You do that with casting. So the first thing you do is you declare your new variable. So we're gonna have number. We're going to change some text into some number. That's going to be the name of my variable. And then after the equal sign, I'm going to write the word cast, C A S T, open for in. The variable type I want my variable to become. So I want this to become a number. So I type number, comma, and then the variable name of the variable I want to change. So in this case, some text. Now, when you output this, it's still just going to say 4.2. So who thinks there's something I might be able to do 
to prove that some number is now a number. Why don't you add something to it? Well, I add something to it. Great. So I'm going to say some number plus 10. So if I'm now outputting some number plus 10, what should show up on the screen when I hit run? Fourteen point two. Winner, winner, fourteen point two. Whereas if I had just output, I'm going to put this in here. You can put multiple output statements, by the way. Some text. And I'm going to output some number as well. So now my screen says 14.2, 4.2, 4.2. Because it has given me my sum number with the addition, the sum text, and the sum number. Does that make sense to everybody? Talking to black squares is fun. Come on, guys, help me out. You all did this for 18 months, too. Okay. All right. Okay. Amanda, uh, yes, just a basic question. So the one that you said that's, you know, the second line from the bottom, output some, some text. Can, can we do that? Some text plus 10. And then does it concatenate? Uh, let's see what happens. Why not? So I'm adding to the line that I had output some text. It now says output some text plus 10. Oh, yeah. Got it says 14.2, 4.210, and 4.2. So, yeah, what it did was concatenate my some text of 4.2 and then the numbers one and zero and it stuck them side by side so visually it looked like 4.210 does that make sense to everybody yep and then it, the screen reader would also read it for you so amanda does it actually keep track that the first two digits of that number would be a text and the second two digits would be a number or does it just say that's all text now? Uh, well. Because I would lean to say it's probably all text now. I have just put minus five there. So let's see what happens. Yeah. Ah, can't do it. It did, it just decided that 10 was a text. Huh. Yeah, because you use that plus sign in a lot of Microsoft stuff in uh -huh. substitution of the whole word concatenate. So I guess yep. that's what it's doing. Yep. That is correct. Good. <clears throat> Having written that part of the compiler, I can say with 100% certainty that that is correct. Yes, but me as the person who has never had Mike as a student, uh, you know, it's great. Let the kids try it, right? Absolutely. No, it's perfect. I love I love what you're doing. It's it's fantastic. I, I do the same thing when I teach as well. So whereas if we went up here and we changed this plus 10 minus 10, the plus 10, let's say plus 10 minus 5. We'll fix our sum text so we don't get error. No, I, I love it. It's a great way to show it because it it does two things. Number one, it shows that you're not going to break anything by just trying something, right? It's just mm -hmm. fine. The worst case scenario, the, the language will say, nope, that's an error. And you go, oh, cool. And then, um, and errors are normal. That's just part of, that's, that's part of programming. It tells you, I mean, really the best part about doing stuff with those errors like that is that um, those errors are designed to prevent a running program from doing something spurious. So like if those errors weren't there, then what it would do is when you run your program, it would still cause an error. It's just it would happen when your program is running at any point in a program's run. 
And so if you can detect it automatically before it even runs, you might as well, right? So anyway, it's either crash now or crash later, I guess is the point. Yeah. So good, good to teach those skills. Yeah. So it's, you know, fun. Kids figure it out, let them try. Ask them those random questions and get their answers before they hit run, right? Um, I know sometimes they're sneaky. They're going to hit run anyway and see what happens, but it's fine. They've learned something either way. All right. So are we good with type condition? We see the idea. If we get it and have to look it up, and that's okay. Would anybody be able to go to a breakout room with me, Daniel, please? Because I'm sorry. I'm so overwhelmed right now. I don't know kind of what lesson you're on. I mean, I, I've done some of this stuff before, but I can't seem to find where you are. I'm just, I'm feeling very overwhelmed at the moment. I'm sorry. Dude, you're good. I'm sorry. Please do not be sorry. That is why Andy brings extra people. Absolutely why. 100% uh, why. I don't know who's available, Andy, so. Let's see, I'm looking at the list of who's on. I think uh, Tim Cluthy, would you be willing again? Yeah, could you send me the lesson we're on? Uh, yeah. I may have gotten a little lost when I went to the last breakout room. No, you're good, dude. Uh, let's see. I have it up, too. I'm gonna put, I'll put the thing in the general chat, and then um, you guys cool. can jump to the room. Or I can move you to one in particular if that helps. Uh, let's see. All the stuff. Oh. Uh, Daniel, I'm going to put you in room one, Daniel, and then Tim... Please okay, thank you. Answer. Yep. Tim okay. Lockwood, wake up. I'm away. I'm over yawning. I'm making me tired over here. I got my coffee. I'm full. More coffee. Oh, coffee, right? All right. Is everybody else? Do we need to go over anything again? We good. Wall screen of people. Zoom is being hateful though. It's always tough online. It's so much easier in person, right? But you know, it is what it is. I got back a few minutes late. Is that where are the 3D characters again? I'm trying to find them, but um, they are under Here, space. And then humanoid is the only humans we have, Steve. And, and where is that? Cool. One moment. Beep, 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 beep. So, Steve, if you're on um, palette. Okay. It's your game and you go to palette, you've got the whole big long list of 3Ds is the top. Yeah. Space 3D and humanoid is the only spot we have. Ah. It looks like a person. I did not check there. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I don't think you were in the room when we found them the first time. So, <laughs> okay. Cool. Okay, thanks. Sure. All right, back to variables and types. All right. So, we are done with uh, type conversion. Variable names. Variable names. Uh, I still think this one should come earlier in the lesson, but I keep forgetting to change it, so it's a my bad. Um, all variables must start with a letter. You can't have the number five be a variable, um, but it can then be ha it can then be have. Wow, it can then have. Numbers, underscores, or characters, uh, any, any letters. Uh, and they give us a lovely list of examples here um, for Sally, Billy underscore likes underscore Sally, and Billy underscore likes underscore Sally too. Um, and then we have a list of things that would not work. Five Sally underscore Sally. Sally, ampersand, ampersand, percent, percent, carrot, dollar sign, asterisk, pound, parenthesis, Y. Uh, that doesn't work. All those guys there in the middle. 
not work. Okay. Um, the reserve symbols. Yes. So the, yeah, those symbols don't work, but numbers, letters, and underscore will. Does that make sense to everybody? Um, we don't talk about it down there. If we go back up to the example we used for uh, type conversion, you'll see that the name of some text started with a lowercase s, and then the T on text was capitalized. Um, that's called camel case because it'll go up and down. Um, and that's just kind of convention. You do not have to do that. Visually, it's easier to tell that there are multiple words there. And I believe a screen reader reads them better that way too. Question? Yes. Capitalizing the first letter of the additional words, the screen parses it apart and reads them yeah. as complete words. Great. I thought that was true. That's why you got the question mark there in the voice. Um, so that's, that's more of convention um, and just makes it easier. You cannot put a space in your variable names. Spaces will not work, okay? There's so also, either, fascinatingly, there's a woman named Bonita Sharif that has been testing this to see if it's easier to read. It turns out it's not just easier to read for people with screen readers. It turns out it's easier to read for people that can see as well. Oh yeah, total. I mean, I could just tell you that because yeah. I'll tell where my next word should start. Yeah, so it's a good convention to have. It makes it sort of easier for programmers to read in general. She, she did a bunch of studies on eye track with eye trackers to find that out. It's pretty fascinating. Yeah, I always tell my students to use it. And when they complain about it, I say, I don't care. That way I can read your things better. Yeah. One, give you the grade. So when, <laughs> when needed, I pull rank on my kids. It's fine. Um, that is the basics of our types and variables. We have any questions on that before we hop back over to the project code? Hearing none. Okay. Now, people are go away pictures. Okay. Um, the last part of our lesson is putting this into our program code. And honestly, Andy, I am not entirely sure where this should go. Oh, okay, sure. Um, so Just because I don't know where it would, I mean, create game would let it still run, yeah? Yep. Cool. You got it. If okay. you, or if you want me to, um, to show it for mine, that's fine too. But it's, uh, but yes, yeah, so we go and create game. So. Okay. Well, I guess we could just kind of talk about the structure of. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. That right now. Cool. Okay. I'll put that back into English for everybody who was listening to me babble at Andy. So what we're going to do now is you're going to go back to your forum studio screen. Okay, so go back into forum studio, back into your project. Okay, and you actually want to go back to the projects tab. So that's control one and then control tab around until you get to projects. You wanna go down to the source code folder inside your game project, your project. And you wanna to go to main.quorum and open that. You open that by just hitting enter on it. Okay. So this page, and then it should automatically dump you over into the editor window. If it didn't, you can hit control two to get to your editor window. Uh, this is where the actual code is written. Okay. Um, it's nicely um, marked up with some comments about what different actions do for you and that sort of thing. 
I'm gonna briefly scroll through it. If I go too fast or too slow, yell at me, okay? Please, I'm serious, yell at me. So the first three lines are libraries that we're gonna use or that are open. Um, we have game, scene, and file. Those will just use the game engine, use the scenes, and the file systems. Pretty self-explanatory. We start with, um, then we have a comment about class main. Uh, line 12 says class main is game. And then we have a comment about the next action. Actions in quorum are functions in other languages. In action, we start game in it. And the way I explain some of the actions that are written for you um, that are part of the quorum language, I tell my students, people way smarter than me wrote code that tells the computer what to do so I don't have to remember to write it every time. And that is exactly what start game is. <laughs> That's how I explain some of those concepts that maybe my students are not quite ready to get. And then we have action create game, which starts on line 24. Um, and it has some things already here for us. We've created a file object. We've loaded the file about our scene. We've loaded our scene. We have physics turned on and we have gravity turned on for 3D, okay? So underneath that, so I'm on the end of line 30 and I'm gonna hit enter so that I am now on a blank line to line 31. Everybody kind of understand where I'm at? There's no real magic about the blank line 31. It's just that I am inside action create game. Okay. And I'm going to tab over twice so that I'm lined up with my set gravity line here. Now we're going to write just like we just did in the online compiler. Okay. And we're going to write cheating with that question. Anything we want. Excellent. We just wanted to output something. So I'm going to output a text, o -T -E -X -T, and it's going to be the name of my player. So my variable is going to be, not payer, player, Jesus, player, name, and then a space, and then equals, and space. And in quotes, I'm going to put the name of my player, and I'm just going to name him. Good guy, all one word. Uh, goof guy, yes, good guy. All right, I'm gonna do a new line. I'm gonna tab in and I'm gonna do output space player name. And I'm actually gonna use a say statement as well. So on a new line, I'm gonna say say and then player name. And I'm not sharing correctly, so one moment. That way. Now, when I run my game, in theory, my map will show up. My player's name will be printed in my console, and it should also say it for me. So, let's see, control R is run. Maybe. I did not hit control R. There we go. Control R. Okay, I didn't hear it say anything, but that doesn't mean a whole lot. But my map showed up, my people showed up, and it did print my player's name. 